Good morning, good morning. What an awesome morning of worship, team. We cannot thank you enough for leading this chorus of worshipers. Amen, as Julian said last week. Good stuff. We're going to give them a minute to get set up, um, but I want to just welcome you back to this series we're doing called Rebuilding. You know, in the first half of the series, we were in the book of Ezra as the exiles returned back to Israel and looking at what it means to rebuild our faith and what it means to rebuild the church. Now, in the last couple weeks, we moved into the book of Nehemiah, which really focuses on what it means to rebuild the culture, what it means to rebuild the society, what it means to put the foundations and boundaries in place so that the community can begin to function again. And we've said that Nehemiah is just this tremendous leader, and in his leadership, he exercises great spirituality in his relationship and dependence on God, and he exercises great strategy because he is a thinker and a planner, and he has great processes. And so whether we are facing a tremendous personal rebuilding, because Nehemiah was facing the rubble of the walls and the gates that were burned around the city of Jerusalem, but whether we are facing that personally whether we are facing that as a church, whether we are facing that in our culture or in our business, in our finances, whatever it is, if we need to get something right, if we need to get it in order, if we need to rebuild, then Nehemiah has great lessons for us. Amen? Amen. 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 So last week we ended chapter two with several questions. And so I just want to refocus us on those questions today as we head into Nehemiah's rules for rebuilding, but can we see beyond the rubble and the ruins to the vision God has? Remember we talked about the ability to see past the ruin and see what God has on the other side of it for us. And then we asked you guys some questions. We closed the service, and I know at least in our women's group on Thursday night, we really dug into these questions a little bit deeper. But are we committed to the work God is calling us to? Are we willing to sacrifice to see his will accomplished? Are we intentional about gathering facts and planning our work? Do we enlist the help of others or try to do it all on our own? I don't know if you guys discussed this in your bridge builders group, but the women got hung up on this little bit of enlisting the help of others just a tad. We find that challenging. And finally, and probably so importantly, do we motivate people based on what God is doing or based on what we think we can do? Do we motivate people based on how awesome we are as leaders? <laughs> or are we motivating people, including ourselves, based on the great God we serve and all that he provides for us to lead from? Amen? Amen. Okay, so that recaps us a little bit. We, one of the things that we really talked about was that prayer and faith does not abdicate our responsibility for planning and process, right? And so today, we're really going to look at a lot of strategy as we get into Nehemiah chapter 3. There's just a lot of straight-up planning. Now, Nehemiah had the right answers to those questions, and because of that, God used him in a tremendous way, and he not only was used by God, but he was able to focus the people and get them rallied around the vision God had. Now, last week, we left off um, our last verse. We left off with Nehemiah 2, 18, the second half of it. And I'd like you to read that with me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began to do this good work. Let me hear y'all do that again. I want to hear my online family too, right? Because I, I see you. I really do. Let's read again. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Work, W-R-O-K. Work is a four-letter word. Did you guys notice that? And sometimes work feels like a four-letter word. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. But what I want us to start today with is that it's not enough to lament the brokenness. We have to learn to labor. It's not enough to just be sad that something's in ruins. We have to be willing to put our hand to the plow. We have to be willing to do the work. And, and folks, whether you lead a team, whether you're on a team, let me tell you, 
Foolish leaders will try to get a few people to accomplish a big work and will overwhelm them. And that's not the way to do it. And what we see in chapter 3 as we head into this is that Nehemiah rallies all the people. He rallies wall-to-wall workers so that section by section, without being overwhelmed, they can get the work accomplished. In that, Nehemiah was able to rally these people to accomplish in 52 days what they had not accomplished in decades. Do you think we could find a Nehemiah to handle the construction on 210? I mean, I feel like the construction on 210 has been a running joke in my sermons for since I started preaching 10 years ago. <laughs> like, uh, you know, could we just get someone to get it done? But, but seriously, like my commuters in the house are like, amen, the commuters online are throwing up chats, amen, right? But, but seriously, guys, if we're honest, it's easy to be a destroyer of things. It's easy to create rubble. Ask any two-year-old. You can rubble a room in no time flat. But it takes a lot more to build from it. You see, the enemy wants to tear down. The enemy wants to destroy. John 10, 9 says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Tear down. Make rubble. Building out of that rubble takes more work. And that's why we're looking in this series at this particular text because building takes character and passion it takes a call to work but it's all founded on prayer and god's call for us to rebuild it's all focused on him isaiah 61 4 says that they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated you feeling hopeless about something in your life you feeling hopeless when you look around at our culture and our society It says they will, God's people, that's us, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Could we use some renewal in our families, in our communities, in our churches? In Nehemiah's time, Jerusalem was in ruins. The surrounding peoples mocked and ridiculed them. We've talked about that for the last two weeks. How could their God be so great if God's city was such a hot mess? Church, we're Jerusalem. We're God's people. What does the world see when they look at us? In the last two weeks, what has the world seen of the church? Scandals, ruin, division, divisiveness, rock throwing and slinging of accusations. The world is seeing a people who are, who think that they will live and die based on who's in political authority. And church, I got to tell you, we live and die because Jesus lived. Church, we live because we have a Savior that died and rose to life and offered that life to us. And it doesn't matter who is in office. Nehemiah was a great leader, not because he had the orders of the king of Persia to stand on. Nehemiah was a great leader because his faith was in the God of heaven. And he stood on the solid foundation of knowing that that is where his strength, that is where his power, and that is where his planning needed to come from and be rooted in. And that is how he rallied the people to do that. So in Nehemiah 3, Nehemiah has the plan, and he doesn't just have the plan, but he he gets the workers to work the plan. I found it interesting as I studied, and you guys are like, is she ever going to get into chapter 3? We are. It's okay. But I found it interesting as I studied this, in all of chapter 3, in all the strategy we're about to see, Nehemiah's name is never mentioned. There is a Nehemiah who does some building. He's the son of someone else, the brother of someone else. It's not the Nehemiah that the book is written on. It's not Nehemiah, the leader. And and so before we even start, there's a lesson for us to remember that the great works that God calls us to do are not about us. (laughs) Because if Nehemiah can motivate all these people and you're about to see all that gets accomplished and his name isn't even mentioned, he's the one circling the walls he's the one rallying the troops he's the one leading and guiding and encouraging them but it's not about him 
It's about God. And so it's just a reminder for us that sometimes we have a vision or we have an assignment for what God has for us. And y'all, sometimes we forget that the vision and the assignment aren't ours. They're God's. Amen. And he's invited us to cooperate with him in it. Maybe that's just a word for me. I'll just leave that hang out there. I have to confess to you that I struggled with how we were going to unpack this passage. I closed out last week telling you, you know, I might just pop up a short little video summary, something this week, and we'll jump into the next text. Um, and, and God really checked me. Uh, you'll see why in a minute. Like, I'm a, if you don't know this about me, I'm a verse-by-verse verse teacher. Like, that's who I am. I like to unpack the word as it flows, unpack the lessons. This is not one of those texts. Like if you read this as part of the reading plan, Nehemiah chapter 3 is the, and these people worked on this section, and these people worked on that section, and these people worked on that section, and some of you came to group going, Pastor Jen, Pastor Rick, like, this week's reading. Ugh. Like how do we get, I tried to find something in there. Guys, there's so much in here that I couldn't do a 10 or 15 minute video on it but it's about how we unpack it. So everybody take a deep inhale and exhale. Whew, I am not going to read chapter 3, all 32 verses, verse by verse, okay? Just as an aside, like towards the end of the week, I try to walk the neighborhood. I pray the neighborhood now that we've got the space next door. Um, I'm there most of the week, and I, and I walk through just having prayer walks. But sometimes towards the end of the week, I'll just listen to other sermons that are on the text once I'm settled, you know, just kind of, listen in and see if there's any nuggets or anything I might want to chase from another perspective. I listened to two pastors read this whole text. I, I'm a scholar. I went to seminary. I was asleep before they were through the first five verses. So we're not going to do that. But what we are going to do is we're going to look at the patterns. As I, as I really studied, as I dug in, I looked for the patterns that emerged between these group, this group and these people and this group and these people and this gate and that gate and that wall because sometimes we have to observe leadership and pull from it what is offered. And there's great value in this. So, so, so I, I had to approach this differently and I'm trying to approach it with a little humor which is not my strong suit but we're going to get there because in this, I, what I decided was that um, before Maxwell's 21 Laws of Leadership, there were Nehemiah's rules for rebuilding. And they're just concrete, structured, simple, whether you are on a team, whether you are leading a team, these are just good nuggets for how we get things done. Y'all facing some walls in your life that you could really stand some help for getting it done? like some rubble in your life, some mess in your life, you're facing some big things and you just need some practical strategies for getting it done? Maybe that's just me. There's some high... Or, uh, mm -mm, let me back up. In the midst of these very practical lessons, because we said Nehemiah is spiritual, connected to God, and strategic. And chapter 3 is all strategy. And so in the midst of these nuggets, we're not going to find a lot of deep theology and high church, but we are going to find a lot of practicality. And it does absolutely start with God. And that's what I want us to see um, as I have you read just a couple of the verses with me. So you guys ready for some practical strategic steps? Amen. And this rainy, dreary day as we face this rainy, dreary week, are we ready for some practical get-it-done steps that can help us along the way with our liquid sunshine, as, as uh, Jerry pointed out? So what I'd like for you to do is read with me Nehemiah 3, verse 1. Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place. Building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. You may skip any names that are in there as we're reading. I will not hold it against you. It is okay. Why are we reading this verse? Well, one, you should know that the Sheep Gate was not about livestock. It started at the Sheep, sheep Gate because the Sheep Gate was where people brought in the animals to be sacrificed, to put on the altar to offer to God. 
The sheep gate was about what was being brought in to be dedicated and given to God. And what I want us to see here is that the priests not only started with the sheep gate and the wall around it, but they dedicated it to the work. And so all of this, like we're going to get to a place where they finish the wall in Nehemiah, spoiler alert, they finish the wall, right? And so we're going to get there and you're going to see this huge celebration. But they didn't wait till they got all the work completed to dedicate it to God. They didn't wait till they got it all finished to remind everyone that the work was for God and about God. Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. So for us today, commit to the Lord whatever work you do in the church, and he'll establish your plans. Commit to the Lord whatever work you do for charity, and he'll establish your plans. Commit to the Lord whatever work you do. Commit to the, work, to the Lord whatever you do. Whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Teachers, parents, husbands, wives, doctors, lawyers, police officers, soldiers, singers, you name it. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plan. Your get it done in 52 days, what couldn't get done in 50 years. Amen. And so the first point that I want to give us, the first rule of rebuilding, is that it all starts with God and it's all for God. By the way, if what you're about to do doesn't line up with what God would have you do, there's a lesson, but that's not from this passage. So we'll save that lesson for another day, but you guys hear me, right? Amen. Okay, kind of quiet in the house, but we'll, we'll go with it. So some basic facts I want to pull out for us um, Kind of an overview. Uh, the word build is used six times in these 30-some verses. The word repair is used 35 times. We touched on this last week that really it was about repairing what was there. It was about seeing what was in the rubble that was still good and useful and just needed to be strengthened. That word repair in the Hebrew means to rebuild, to make strong, to strengthen, to make firm. They didn't need to go out and get all new stuff. What they needed to rebuild the wall was sitting in the ruins and the rubble right in front of them. And so what I want to say is that, church, when we look at how this applies to us, we don't need all the fancy bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. We don't need all the extras. There's nothing wrong with the extras, but they are not required to do the work of Jesus. The bells and the whistles aren't necessary. And as the world looks at us, there's a whole lot of fallen leaders that had a lot of bells and whistles. Yeah. They don't save us. What makes us strong, what strengthens us as a church is that we build on character and conviction. We build on the strength of God's love for us and others, on the solid foundations of prayer and scripture and Jesus who opened the gate for all of us to enter in. Amen? Amen. Good word, good word. So a couple other facts for us and why we're not reading all of this because this is what you'd hear one by one by one. There are 45 sections of wall that are talked about in this chapter. There are 10 gates within those sections. There are 42 groups of people, 42 teams that made up the big team along with 28 named individuals. And those teams were not all one type of person. The teams, the 42 groups, the 28 individuals were rulers, priests, men, women, artisans, craftsmen, and people from neighboring towns. You see, great leaders gather great teams to get the great mission God has given them done. Nehemiah organized his teams by common interest and by geography. That's just a good little nugget for us. And we mentioned last week that the wall itself was one and a half miles approximately, and it surrounded 80 to 90 acres of land. Some group some groups worked right outside their home and some groups worked, came in from outside to work. 
folks from Gibeon, which was six miles northwest of Jerusalem, folks from Tekoa, which was 12 miles south of Jerusalem. Jericho was further away than that. So when God gives us his great assignment to bring together a great group of people, if you don't see workers to do the work, then you need to rethink. You need to go back to that foundation of prayer. You need to ask God for direction. And you need to build teams. Mm -hmm. Nehemiah didn't have everyone focus on the whole wall because it would have been overwhelming. He had them focus on their section and their peace. Guys, everybody had a part to play. In this church, if you sit in this seats, if you sit uh, online, whether you are local, whether you are a little ways away, whether you are on the other side of the ocean, there's a part for you to play. It uh, uh, brought, brought me right back to 1 Corinthians 12 where it talks about the parts of the body. All the parts are brought together to do the work of Christ. Verse 12 and verse 27, I'll just bookend it. Just as a body, though one... Um, just as a body, the one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. Verse 27 says, now you are part of the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. So we all have a part to play in the work of God. Amen? Amen. 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 I'm going to try that again. We all have a part to play in the work of God. Amen? Amen. All right, let's let him hear you over at Clarity. I liked that. That was really good. <laughs> All right, so, so those are, that's one of our lessons. We're going to skip down to Nehemiah um, 3, 5 for the next lesson. And I want you to read with me. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. Tekoa, that was 12 miles south, their men did the work, but the nobles wouldn't put their shoulder to the work. Now, lots of nobles from all around had contributed money, but can I tell you, when there's a mission of God to be done, the mission requires wallets and work. One does not exclude you from the other, right? This is not, God's plan was never pay the pastor to do the work. Yeah, that was pretty. Yeah. That God's plan was never to pay the pastor to do all the work. Amen. Now, we don't have that in this group. Like, we're a church plant. Everybody comes putting their shoulder to the plow, right? Like, that's what you guys do. But we got to have that as a foundation because as the church grows and people come in, they need to know that there's a place for them. And not just so the work is lighter, but so that the reward, the victory of partnering with God and what he's doing is something that everybody experiences. Yeah. So tithing, yeah, exactly. Tithing doesn't end with our tithe. It also includes our time and our talent. Amen. Now, the other thing about this is that even though the nobles wouldn't do the work, the men came from 12 miles away. By the way, they were commuting by donkey and foot, okay? How'd you like to get to D.C. on that commute? They came from 12 miles away, and they didn't just do the work in their section. Later on in the chapter, the men of Tekoa actually take on a whole other section. They take on a second place. So if you are on a team and you serve under some leadership that you think, yeah, this is what I would say, don't be limited by bad leadership. Don't be limited by the nobles who are sitting over you. Don't be limited by that. Lead from underneath. Lead from where you are. Do what is right. Okay. 3.8. I told you guys, like these are, rules, these are rules for rebuilding. There's no great big thing to unpack, but there's a whole lot of steak bites to chew on. Amen? So let's read uh, verse 8 together. Uzziel, son of Hanhiah, one of the goldsmiths. Repair, wait, pause right there. Let's just start at one of, okay? One of the goldsmiths repaired the next section. And Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Goldsmiths and perfume makers. 
People who work with fine, delicate metal to hammer it into beautiful art, and people who take different scents, different oils, different things, who have a, a palate in their nose that makes things appealing to other people, who have a refined artisan way about them. You think moving boulders and shoveling dirt was on any of their resumes? No. You see, um, sometimes we work in our calling, but other times we got to work because there's work to be done. Like, it's that simple. We, we want to be in our passion. We want to work in our passion on the broad scale of life. Like, we want to work for what God created us to do. But sometimes there's just a wall to build, and that may not be your thing, but God is going to call you to help, and we need to be willing to do that. These are examples of people who were willing to lean in and do what needed to be done, even though they were no expert at it. it, it you know, it would have been really easy for the goldsmiths in particular to be like, yeah, I'm a little too good for that. Like if I hurt my hands, my like that's just a little, that, that builder move, boulder, boulder building is just, I'm not feeling that. I'll, I'll make, I'll tell you what, I'll make the gold seal that goes on the wall when it's all done. How's that? Or it would have been easy for them instead of thinking too much of themselves to think too little of themselves. Like, I'm a perfume maker. Uh, I'm a goldsmith. I don't, I don't have the strength. I, I, don't, I don't have the skill set to do what needs to be done. And yet God called them to it, and they did it. With God, when we walk in mission, we walk in humility, and we walk in his strength. Because Jesus sacrificed everything the creator served the creation yeah. church the creator served and died and suffered for the creation so whether we are artisan scholar or noble none of us are above putting our hand to the plow to do the same and so, again, sometimes we work in our calling and other times we work because there's work to be done. Business leaders, CEOs, team managers, sometimes you need to get down with your people and clean the toilets. Like, sometimes you just need to do what needs to be done to show them that it is not beneath you. We okay? Amen. Good lessons? You guys getting some application for this? Like, don't always make your kids do all the scut work in the house when they're cleaning, right, parents? Sometimes we got to clean the baseboards, too. That was my favorite top. My favorite thing to assign the boys when they were bad. They were washing baseboards, and it saved me. I was so happy about it. I mean, when their behavior was bad. Sorry, kids. Sorry. Good thing I have good teachers in my life to square me away. All right, so we are going to read 8. Um, let's see. Verse 12 is what we're going to go with next. So um, say this with me. Shalom. Hmm, Holhesh. I'm probably not even saying that right, and that's okay. But we're going to read 312 together. To the best of our ability, amen? amen. <laughs> All right. Shalom, son of Halahesh, ruler of a half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. What do I want to pull out of this? What lesson is in this? Hmm. Don't let our preconceived notions of people disqualify them from the work God has called them to. Don't disqualify the called. We get so caught up in our, and this is not just about women or girls, okay? We get so caught up in our expectations of what people should be, how they should look, what they should do, what they should say that we miss valuable teammates and we miss valuing teammates because they aren't what we expected. When we expect people to look a certain way or meet certain criteria, we miss out on God's provision that he intended to bring through them. Let me, how was worship today? How was worship today? Who would have hired a 17-year-old worship leader when you're planting a church? Raise your hand. No, don't, because his mom's in the room. 
his mom may not have hired a 17-year-old worship leader if it wasn't her son, right? Like, who does that except God brought Julian and said, this is the plan. And if I had been stuck in my preconceived notions of what I needed a leader to look like, then we all would have missed out. We can't miss the giftings and the gifts of who is in front of us. It's like, you know, the little commercials, have you seen them? Like, fight like a girl, it's not a bad thing anymore, right? Like, fight like a girl, right? Because we're not wimps. But anyway, that's for the girls in the house. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, so we read three or four verses about a specific context about a specific situation in a specific context, and we think it applies to everybody and everything. And when we do that, we miss out on Miriam, Deborah, Hulda, Phoebe, and a half a dozen other people, women in Scripture, a half a dozen of which Paul himself calls out for being great leaders. Okay? Mm -hmm. Nobody expected the Messiah's team. Let's, Let's forget about, let's just go straight Jesus. Nobody expected the creator's team to have a tax collector, some stinky fishermen, some unworthy people, and some women with questionable histories on his team. And yet that's who Jesus chose. That's who Jesus called. And so, guys, when you have work to do, when God has given you a task, when you are looking at your ministry or your career or your team, do not disqualify people who are called because you're the one who's going to miss out. They're going to go serve somewhere else. They're going to go somewhere else. God's going to send them somewhere else and you will have missed out on the gifts that they bring. Jesus didn't see with our eyes and our continual prayer as leaders needs to be that we see with his eyes. Are y'all ready for a fun one? You kind of chuckled about this last week. I heard a couple of you, but we didn't, I didn't call you out on it. So let's read verse 14. The dung gate was repaired by Malchajah, son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Beth Hakaram. He rebuilt it and put its doors with their bolts and bars in place. The dung gate. That's not like a word that means something different now than it meant back then. It was appropriately named. It was the gate for the waste removal for all of Jerusalem. What in the world are we going to pull? Actually, there's a couple big lessons here for us as leaders. You can't just bring sacrifices in the sheep gate and expect life to be okay. You've got to get the rubbish and the poo out of your life and send it out where it belongs. And by the way, it's going to try to sneak its way back in and ruin things and poison and taint things. So you better get your bars and your bolts in place. Okay. So I'm just going to tell you, this is a shallow example, right? But, um, I committed to do this whole elimination diet. I was having some health issues. I was having some health problems. And so an elimination diet, Whole30, no sugar, no dairy, no gluten, no beans, no rice, no grains, right? Like, I couldn't just say I'm not going to eat those things. I had to get them out of my kitchen. I had to get them out of my house. Actually, I'm doing this for several months and I, like, for the first two weeks, I couldn't walk through the bakery at the grocery store, right? Like, I had to have my bolts and bars in place because you can have good intentions. Guys, there's big boulders in the rubble that we use to build, and there's rubble and dust that just needs to be gotten rid of. And you're not going to tackle rebuilding in your life without putting out the things that poisoned it in the first place. Amen. Amen. you got to do some work to make sure those things don't come back in. You gotta have safeguards in place to prevent their return. And so I gave you a shallow example because I didn't wanna go heavy and deep, but I think we all know some broken places in our life that had some poison, that we had some rubbish, had some waste, had some poo that needed to go. Mm -hmm. And so what are you putting in place to make sure that it doesn't creep back in? The other lesson here, back, back, back to the dung gate and the wall that adjoined said gate. Um, first of all, the work, let me rephrase that. The waste 
The waste of Jerusalem did not stop while the work was being done. Nobody said, everybody hold it for 52 days. Nobody said, keep your animals outside for 52 days. The waste didn't stop while the work was being done, and yet it still had to be done. And so sometimes hard work stinks, and it still needs to be done. I know that's quippy. You all didn't laugh. I'm really disappointed. I told you I'm not good at humor. I'm trying. But sometimes the hard work stinks. It's true. But we still got to get it done. We still got to press in. We still got to persevere to get through it. Let me ask you, who did the stinky work? Did you guys notice that? The ruler of a district. Not the workers. Not, not the, not the, he didn't, he didn't say, well, I'm going to get those perfume makers now. Let's see if they're smelly good. We'll help this smelly, but no, the ruler, the ruler of the district went back to do that. Great leaders do not think that there's any work that's beneath them. Yeah. Leaders be willing, be willing. Leaders be wary. Yeah. There are some people that always come into a project and all they want is the easy job. All they want are the pretty shiny tasks. There are people that, not in this church, but there are people who walk into church and all they want is the platform. When people like that come your way, leaders hand them a shovel and, and, and let them get to work. Yeah. And if they're not willing to do it, you better have some prayer and discernment. Because for people who only want to do the pretty work, there's a warning in that. Are we okay? Amen. How are we doing? How are we doing? How are these lessons for life? Like you got things you need to rebuild in your life and you're thinking, okay, I can take that. I can apply that. I can build a team with that. I can be a better team player with that. Did you think of the person that maybe you have discredited that's come to be on your team and maybe you need to ask God, what God has them bringing in? Like maybe, maybe get some adjustments, maybe just me? Okay, no, I see nodding heads. How about online? Are we seeing some things that we can apply here? Yes, I see big nods back there. So we're going to read Nehemiah 3, 22 and 23 together. Let me do a quick scan. Benjamin, you guys say Benjamin, you got that one. Hashab, Hashab, Azariah, and I'll say the rest. Okay. We good? Let's read 22 and 23 together. The repairs next to him were made by the priests from the surrounding region. Beyond them, Benjamin and Hashab made repairs in front of their house. And next to them, Azariah, son of Maasiah, the son of Ananiah, made repairs beside his house. It's not just these two groups that made repairs by their house throughout this text we have six different workers and an unspecified number of priests who repaired the walls next, excuse me, next to their homes. Guys, we can't repair the brokenness in the world if we don't start at home. Yeah. We can't be willing to lean in and give everything to the world and not give anything to our families, our neighbors, our friends. Mother Teresa said, if you want to save the world, start at home. Start with your family. Well, what does it say to our kids, our spouse, our, our close in circle, our co-workers? What does it say to the people closest to us if we can give 50 hours a week to work and 20 hours a week to the church and we have scraps to give them? What does that teach them? What does that teach our kids about God? Now look, my boys, one of them's online this morning, but my boys half lived at the church with me. That is true. <laughs> like they could run the sound system at New Life. They could do all kinds of stuff. They set up for women's ministry events, but I was beside them and I spent time with them before and after. Rick invested in our kids. And, and, and I think if we had it all, I know, I know if we had it all to do over again, we'd have wished somebody would have preached this lesson from Nehemiah so we'd invested a little bit more with them. And so we've got to start at home. And it's not just starting at home, but it, okay, 
home our families, but then if we're Bridge Church, what's our home? What's, what's right outside our walls? I mean, we need to have missions that are in Waldorf, and, and it's good. We're going to always have an international piece to the missions because, because God said to invest in other places. But the bulk of what we do, the bulk of how we serve our family outside these walls, food distribution, Easter outreach, um, sponsoring these classrooms with the kids. Like, we have to start right here because saving the world starts at home. And no matter where you lead, no matter where you have influence, whether it is with your families or in the workplace, No matter where you lead, people are watching. And they're watching to see if you are willing to fix what is broken right beside you. Or if you're going to gloss right over that and go try to solve someone else's problem first. So we have to be careful. Guys, what we see all throughout this chapter is that sometimes the work is hard, right? Sometimes the work is extra. The men of Jacoa and a few other guys, a few other groups, they didn't just fix their section. They fixed the next session. Some of you are facing difficult challenges. Some of you are facing really big walls. And I know the work is hard, and I know sometimes it's extra. We have to compare the broken walls in Nehemiah to the broken places in our lives. We have to compare the broken walls in Nehemiah to the broken places in our culture. And we have to recognize that the season we're in requires extra. Y'all know that, right? Like Man. church planting, extra. Pandemic, extra. Portable church, extra. (coughs) But the extra is temporary. And before I get into my last point, I want to ask Pastor Rick to come up because while God was giving me this point in the message, God was giving Pastor Rick a word about it. And so, would you join me up here? Yeah, uh, I just, something uh, this week, really cool, uh, really a God thing. Um, You know, we were sitting down one morning and reading our devotions. We were in Nehemiah, and we were in Nehemiah 8, and just going through verses 13 to, for 13 to 18. And uh, I started reading through it, and I got to noticing, you know, they, they gathered the people around. I mean, all these key words, right, to me, they just kept popping out on the page. They gathered people around. The Lord commanded through Moses, um, talked about proclaiming his word and spreading his word, you know, gathering in, in company. Um, their joy was great, celebration. And then it talked about the, the law, written in the law, the Lord had commanded through Moses that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters. And as I was reading that, God put two things on my heart, two words. He put body, our body, and he put black box. And it just, it, 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 it just struck me that, um, you know, we're to be celebrating and we're to be joyful. But this is temporary. Our bodies here on earth are temporary, Right? It's, it's that, it's that um, forever um, relationship and, and the time that we'll be with God. Citizens of heaven. Yeah. We're on, a, we're on a work visa. And then there's the other part, right? Because we've been working really hard launching a church, you know, a portable church, as you talked about, in this space. Black box. It's temporary. God reaffirmed that it's, this is temporary. This is a temporary thing. Don't know what's next. Don't know, you know, where or how that's going to work out. But just know that it's a temporary thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so I just want to encourage you guys because God, uh, that wasn't just for me. Right. Um, God also spoke to a couple other people um, that very morning, right, because we got together, a couple of us, and we we're talking about it, and they're like, ah, 
ah, so there's, there's, there's something yeah. to it. Yeah. So, so with that, uh, thank you very much. Um, with that, as, as I was writing the message, God reminded me that this situation of extra labor, the situation of extra work is temporary. Like we're sending you guys out this Easter survey. Can I tell you that Easter service is not normally going to happen in a tent? It's not normally going to require set up and tear down. It's not normally going to require the investment of time, talent, and money, right? But this year, it is. Like normally, if you're doing Easter outside, it's sunrise service, and most of y'all aren't showing up for that. And so, so, but, but this year, Easter service is in a tent, and it's outside, and we're going to invest the time and the talent and the labor to get that done. In the midst of 2021 with COVID, the, the work is extra, and the work is more, but it's temporary. God has something for us to do. There's extra setup. There's extra teardown. We know that. There's, there's extra funds required. Lord knows how much extra hand sanitizer and masks and gloves that we all need to have because of COVID. Can I get an amen? But it's temporary. We're going to go back to the regular. This meeting in black box is temporary. By the way, put black box and portable church together. And we've got instead of needing two services for 65 seats, which is what we have right now, we would have had two services for 180 seats. And so that's temporary. The restrictions will lift. We'll get back to things. Worship rehearsals at our house, like seating charts, all the things that have to happen with the volunteers. All the work, all the time, all the talent, all the time. And God said, I, I got you doing this big work. I've called you to this community of Indian Head and I'm equipping you and I'm giving you each a section of the wall. And I know it's hard, but it's temporary. I've got you. We're going to get this wall built and we're going to have great celebration. Today in announcements, we mentioned that there's room. We're going to have a prayer team meeting next week. We're going to solidify our prayer team, our prayer warriors that have been doing things behind the scenes and bring that. There's a social media team meeting. Boy, talk about where we are as a society in 2021 and then where we are because of COVID. Social media is important. There's a social media team. But there's all these other places to plug in. There's tech. There's greeting. There's bridge kids. Worship is looking awesome. So, um, Julian, I'm just not advertising for you today because you guys are like full. Woo, they're setting the pace for us, Right? But there's places, and don't think. Don't be the perfume maker that thinks that they don't have the strength to do what God's calling them to. Actually, the perfume maker did just fine. But don't, don't buy that lie. The restoration and the reversal, the, the restoration of Jerusalem brought a reversal to their humiliation. For us as New Testament believers, we don't walk in shame and humiliation. Jesus took that from us. But the rebuilding is so that the love God has for us and has for the world gets expressed to them through our hands. And guys, we have a choice to make. Today the choice is, do we believe the lies of the enemy who is the destroyer, the ruins maker, the rubble maker? And are we going to cooperate with his, line, his lies that the church is broken, America's going down the tubes, we can't do anything, there's too much, there's too much work, it's too hard, it's not going to happen, we're not good enough, we're not strong enough, we're too good to do that. Like, you put the words in there that Satan uses in our minds. Are we going to believe those lies and cooperate with that and contribute to the rubble are we going to believe the truths of God and cooperate with that, that we are more than conquerors through Christ, that we are a royal priesthood co-heirs with Christ, that each one of us is an important part of the body of Christ with a job to do, with work to do, with tasks at hand to serve God and cooperate with him, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, that we can love our neighbors and pray for our enemies and that we are seen and known and loved by God. Will we cooperate with those words, those promises, and instead of being rubble makers, will we be rebuilders? Will we, will we connect our neighbors 
and the needs of our community with the unconditional, empowering love of God through Jesus Christ. Because that is our walk. That is our task. That is our assignment.